Can we call, uh, can we pause right here real quick? Because my dog's about to piss on the floor. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Ball Nine Roundhouse. It's been a while, it's been a long off season, but we are getting closer to spring training. So we figure we pay you guys a little visit today. Um, I am joined today by our ombudsman, Rocco Constantino, America's most beloved sports writer, Kevin Kernan, is back with us, and Will Omen, our Southpaw um, aficionado. What's going on, fellas? How are you? Fantastic. All right. All right. Fantastic is good. Um, I'm good, so too. So as we Rocco know. Looks like he's confused. Good. Well, focus here. Same thing. Focus. Okay. All good. You're doing, looking up you're doing research. That's exactly what I'm doing. I think I got something good for later. Okay. Awesome. awesome. Does it involve well, where to get uh, the best logo hat of all time? <laughs> right at least. This one? There's some uh, endorsement. <laughs> yeah, it's not the Yankees, well, listen. you dimwit. It's the Montreal oh, Expos. Well. That, that hat is sick in every sense of the word. Love it is it. as good as it gets. It really is. Well, listen, we are um, fresh on the heels of the Hall of Fame announcement that was yesterday. Um, obviously, Adrian Beltre, Todd Hutton, and O'Mauer are the newest inductees going in with Jim Leland. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit. Uh, Kevin, you covered him for all guys. Will, you faced him. Uh, Rocco and I watched him. So we're going to get into a little bit about these guys real quick, and I will start. Um, Kevin, your column today uh, was basically you know, talking about these guys and, and and your vote for the Hall of Fame and accomplished while they were in the league. So I'll start with you. Um, how about these three guys? How about this class? Uh, I, I voted for three of them, so. Yeah, I voted for all three, of course. Um, I voted for 10 this year, kind of went over the limit, but uh, I wanted to get some points in, and I like to piss off people, so I voted for Omar Vizquel because uh, uh, he deserves it. I mean, you know, I look, every, you know, we, we go through the numbers all the time. This guy had, you know, he, he was a compiler, but he compiled a lot of great numbers. He was a great shortstop. He's down to 17%. He was trending to go in, then he had the issues, and then... And I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what's going on, but it seems like he's still out in public living his life. So uh, why can't he go to the Hall of Fame? But that's a uh, that, that's a side that's a side note. The uh, yeah, these guys to me they were no brainers. Um, I, I, uh, Todd Helton, this this cracks me up when people say, "Oh, he played in Colorado and he had all that." Of it. You know what? He played 17 years for the same team. I love that. You know what? He could have went somewhere else. And the other thing that people don't understand, and Will can attest to this, but Pitchers and hitters both get affected in Colorado. You're hitting in Colorado. You have all that green space. The ball carries, so that's a great situation. But also, you're used to pitchers, you know, the ball breaking a certain way. All of a sudden, you go on the road, and there's a lot more movement. you got to make adjustments. you got to do this. So, so, you know, I hold nothing against Helton for that. Joe Maurer, his first 10 years. You know what? I, I like in Joe Maurer, uh, and then he got the concussion, slowed down a little bit. But he, he was a great catcher. You know, and uh, I like in his career a little bit. I think I think it should give us another look at, at Thurman Munson, to be honest. That's why I voted for Mauer, because I, I got a little grief from people. Oh, is he a first ballot Hall of Famer? But I've been trying to get Thurman in for years, you know, and, and it ain't working because people don't forget about the past. But, you know, Thurman's numbers are very similar. Actually, if you look at Thurman's 10 years, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It's better than all the other guys that are in the Hall of Fame in a lot of different ways. And I'll even bring up the nasty word of war. This war was really good in different situations. So that was part of his, uh, Mauer. Belcher was a, a late bloomer a little bit. Didn't make an all-star team until he was 31. Um, just the other thing all three of these guys had, they all had joy for the game, and I like that. I like that. So, uh, you know, it's supposed to be a celebration. Only 385 guys vote. I'm one of the 385. I'm, I'm very happy to do it. But I take it very seriously, you know. Um, and, and the guys I look at, uh, you know, the guys I look at, I, I look at very seriously. And, and, again, I watch them play. 
and I know we're going to get into this later, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop here, but I want to make this point early so people can think about it. Gary Sheffield should have been in ahead of all these guys. It's, it's really that simple. Sheffield was the one guy nobody wanted to face. Um, we'll, we'll talk about Sheffield later, but I just want to throw that out on the table to get us wrong. <laughs> all right, well, that brings me, Will, you faced all these guys. Uh, and, you know, to Kevin's point about Colorado, you know, how does that play in your mind? I mean, how, how did you approach these guys differently in Colorado? So I, I actually I grew if up in did. Colorado. I grew up in Colorado playing high school baseball there. And so uh, the the mental side of the game going into course field um, and the different altitude, it didn't it didn't bother me because I just kind of innately knew like, hey, yeah. it, the job remains the same. Um, however, I would say the biggest advantage in at course field is not the altitude. It's the gaps. The green space. And, exactly. Exactly. And I would I would I would say unequivocally that if I was the pitching coach uh, for the Rockies, anybody else, if I was the bench coach lining up a defense, I'm playing the gaps as opposed to the the depth of the ballpark. Um, what Helton did, he was he was not a premier slugging guy. He was a he was a pro hitter. And he utilized, if anything, on, on the compiler argument, he got balls into spaces where there weren't people. That's good hitting. He also did that on the road, too. So piss off with that argument. The dude, <laughs> the dude is a flat-out baller. And the fact well, that he played for I'm, one I'm team is in, awesome. Well, I want to jump in here simply because you brought it up, but Tony Gwynn recognized that early on that he was a great hitter. And he sat yeah. it down. And I put it in my article today. But Tony, and, and Todd mentioned it last night in his little interview, that Tony gave him the best advice ever. You know, when, you, when you're in the box, look at the pitcher's logo, slide your eyes over. Because what happens is the worst thing for hitters, guys, as we all know, is tensing up. Now, you may think you're loose. You may think you're, but if your eyes are looking at one thing, they could blur a little bit. So Tony had this little trick where you look at the logo, and then as the righty or lefty, you slide over real like a picture frame, and boom, you're ready to hit. So, and he recognized that ability of helping to hit the ball into the gaps. That's such a great point, and and that's real baseball, and that's you know that's why I like talking with you guys because you get real baseball facts, not just some some crazy numbers, you know. So yeah, that's what Helton did. Let me let me piggyback on that real quick because it's the same sure. thing I've taught my son and every other kid I've taught about baseball. And I, I learned it long ago, and it probably a trickle down from from Tony. But the fact here, let me look at my hat. I'm pitching. Ball yeah. comes right out of the back side right of my head. The, right out of the bill, right? It's right so there. when I'm teaching a pitcher, conversely, it's the same premise. If I'm back here, ball's hidden. This is what deception is, is me staying with the ball hidden as long as possible. Right. And when I have guys that do that and they pull their head out, you can see the ball earlier. That's no and bueno. You, and you, you can see the ball earlier. You can see what, what kind of pitch it is. You can see your hand. It's uh, That's a great little point. That's a great teaching point. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, just locking in on that, it's not moving anywhere. <laughs> right. You know, but as soon as it, as soon as it does, it's like, hello, the ball's here. Um, and, and that's how you got guys who are throwing a hundred, you know, just giving up rockets and you got to get the married guys off the infield. That's no fun. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, the other thing I was thinking when you were talking, well, especially in this new age we were in where things are, aren't like they always used to be. What's to stop Colorado to, to putting a four man outfield out there sometimes maybe with certain type of hitters? Would that work, or is that uh, create too much of another gap somewhere else? Well, I mean, the only guy you could the only guy you could take out is the third baseman, mm -hmm. and then you're forcing the other team into a bunt scenario, and you just single them to death in a different way. And there's a million different there's a million different you know defensive strategies you can use, but now they have a rule in that you have to have two guys on each side of the bag, so you right. effectively <laughs> eliminated that by rules, and you know. As much as I don't want to cause too much controversy, Manfred and his 
and his tinkering with the rule book has painted baseball into a corner mm -hmm. instead of seeing the forest for the trees. What you do you know, mean the, by that? The, exactly? <laughs> excuse me. Um, Wait, yeah. it, it started with it started with replay. Yeah. Where you open Pandora's box and it was supposed to be fair foul home run. And now it's become something that is not the spirit of the game and we're looking for infinitesimal spaces oh. on a tag play in slow super slow motion right that was yeah. never what the intent was then um then you go into things like the three batter minimum uh what happened to a manager actually just having to deal with the consequences of his actions not to mention the fact that you got a guy say you know craig kimbrell comes to mind when he had his struggles with control, he's like, yeah, he might walk the house, but I got to leave him out there and endanger mm. two more batters. If a guy gets the yips, if I put him out there to start the inning, you know, he's got to face three guys. Well, that effectively takes away any power control a manager has over his staff. It, it, it's, it's, just, just, it's asinine. It is. And it's it just absolutely asinine. And Jim Leland just made the Hall of Fame because he managed games and did things where he could take a guy out or, you know, bring in a lefty specialist, do all those things that made baseball fun, you know. So, yeah, I agree with you. He's panning not him to in mention the fact that, Not to mention the fact that he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Barry Bonds in Pittsburgh. It's one of the greatest YouTube highlights. <laughs> and, 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 and you go, and it's not because it's not because of who he's talking to. It's just how he's talking. Like, I'm the manager. I run the show. Right. You do what I say because we're playing this, and I, I've I've done. It. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, and evidently Bonds loved him for it. Bonds right. sings his praises because he just he's, he's my manager, you know. So it works. Yeah, you got. I mean, you get enough alphas right. in the room, man. Somebody's gonna somebody's gonna go toe to toe, and that's fine because that's where you you know mutual respect comes in. You don't have to agree. You have to figure out who who is the top dog, just because that's how things roll downhill. It's like Saving Private Ryan, and they're on they're they're on the beach at Normandy. He's like, you know, that's how gripes work; they go up. <laughs> that's a good. Well, point. and, and good Bochi, point. I think Bochi brought real manhood back to managing this year, and and more teams need to do that. And I even I'm going to go so far as to say we're seeing it in the NFL now with the Detroit Lions, Dan Campbell. You know, they respect him. He manages. Absolutely. He's the alpha dog, you know, and, and his players will go to war for him. And that's what they've done by neutering most of these managers who have allowed themselves to be neutered because there's only 30 jobs or whatever, you know. So it happens. But I'm, I'm hoping we're getting back to uh, managers being in charge. And one quick, uh, you know, one quick Bond story for you guys. Um, so, again, my friendship with Tony Gwynn, I, I was watching Tony hit one day, and, and Bonds was talking to him, and they were talking hitting, and we were going to San Francisco in a few days. And I said, hey, Tony, I want to do a story with you and Barry. You're different hitters, but you kind of have a lot of the same approaches. And he goes, oh, that's great. So he gave me a sit down. I'll talk to Barry. So I set it up with uh, the PR department. Tony set it up with Barry. I go up there on a Friday. You know, I'm there for a three-game series. Uh, Friday, I go over to Barry, sitting on the bench. Hey, Barry, can you give me those 10 minutes? Uh, I want to ask you about Tony and your hit and stuff. No, man, I'm real busy. Okay. I, I move on. Saturday, I come back. He's sitting on the bench. Barry, you got those 10 minutes? No, man, I'm real busy. Okay. I said, but we got to do it Sunday, Barry. I'm not, you know, I'm going to be here Sunday. I'm out of here on Sunday night. Oh, yeah, we'll do it tomorrow. 11 a.m., quiet. As you know, Will, 11 a.m., quietest time in the ballpark. All, 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 you know, Sunday mornings, 11 a.m., super quiet. Barry's sitting there leaning on his back. I said, Barry, let's get this done. He goes, no, man, I'm busy. So me being me, most writers wouldn't do this. I said, oh, you're busy, huh? Because now the New Jersey of me comes out. He goes, yeah, I'm busy. <laughs> you busy? I go, yeah, I'm busy too. He goes, what are you busy doing? You know, you know how Barry could be, just like in that room. What are you busy doing? I said, I'm busy thinking about my MVP vote. That's what I'm thinking about right now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And he goes, 
You have an MVP vote? And I did. I was in San Diego. I was the chapter chairman, so I could get the vote I wanted to get. I wanted to get MVP. He goes, sit right down. Gave me 40 minutes. Talked about his earring for the first time. How it was his grandfather's cross. I went in to see Dusty later. Dusty goes, I can't believe Barry told you all that stuff. And I told Dusty what I did. He goes, that's what you got to do with Barry. And it worked. And then at the end, of course, it was almost like a scene from, uh, you know, Clint Eastwood movie. He goes, hey, man. I got to ask you, you going to vote for me? Were you going to vote for me? I go, Barry, of course I'm going to vote for you, but you were busting my balls, so I had to bust yours. So that, that's what we're doing. <laughs> that's awesome. Excellent. Oh, that's good stuff. And to this day, that's Barry, when I come by, he listens. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, Rocco, you know, let's get to you for a second here. I mean, you're a resident small hall guy, so you're seeing these three guys go in. Um you know, just your thoughts on, on, I mean, you've watched these guys' whole careers. So your mm-hmm. thoughts from fan side, writer side, on these three inductees and, um, you know. Yeah, I mean, I was, as I'm watching their careers, I, I'm thinking all along, Helton's a, a Hall of Famer. I'm watching a Hall of Famer. Uh, I thought the same thing with Adrian Beltre, too, especially late in his career. Uh, Mallory didn't really think that watching. Uh, I thought he was more of a Hall of Very Good kind of guy. But as, you know, he retired, you digest his career, you see how the game evolves. And and I came around on him, too. Um, I don't get too much into the first ballot type of stuff. Um, You know, I think that's lost a lot of its luster over the last 20, 30 years. But, um, you know, it does, I guess, bristle me a little bit. Gary Carter's got to sit there and wait for six years. Um, You know, Piazza's sitting around waiting a couple of years. And Mauer's in, and Thurman's out. I, I think Thurman's first ten years and Mauer's first ten years are really comparable. Um, and I do think that that opens the door for Thurman again. Um, I think you know. I hope hopefully he'll be on the ballot in December. Um, his group is up, and hope you know the way they restructure things, um, it'll be even tough to get on the ballot in December. But I, I think he'll be on, um, and I hope he gets a little bit more you know more recognition than the last time. Uh, the last time he was up was was 2020, and um, he only he got three or he got less than three votes, um, and he was in that group with um, Steve Garvey, um, who's going to be on it again possibly. Dave Parker, who, who might be on it again. So um, you know it's an interesting ballot. Uh, we'll see. Hopefully, it allows people to, to re-examine Thurman Munson. And the one thing I thought was real interesting with Helton too. I mean, his hitting I thought speaks for itself. But um, his fielding was great, too. I, I, you know, great nugget that I saw was he's just the third guy, um, third national leaguer. I'm sorry, third. He's just the third ever first baseman who played his entire career in the NL to have multiple gold gloves in the Hall of Fame. So it's yeah. really it's just Bagwell, uh, Gil Hodges, and now um, Todd Helton. Those are the only guys from the NL that, that have multiple gold gloves. So, um, you know. I, 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 at no point in his career did I think I was sitting there watching somebody who was going to fall short of the Hall of Fame. It's a shame it took him this long. You know, speaking of taking a long time, we did see Gary Sheffield fall off the ballot. Now, Kevin, I know you voted for him, and he fell a little short. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the dinning man. So, obviously, Sheffield, uh, Wagner fell just short. Billy Wagner, was he missed it by, what, five votes? I Four. Believe. Uh, Andrew Jones, who I thought would probably would have a little bit better of a showing this year. Um, Kevin, you know, I know you wanted to get into Sheffield a little more, so uh, now's your chance. Well, first of all, Chef is a li- he's a little bit like Barry in some, in some degree. You know, he it took a little once you got to know him, you were fine with him. And um, you know, I had him in San Diego, for, and he was great in San Diego. I had Fred McGriff and him together. Fred was the big brother, and Gary kind of tagged along, but Gary always his own independent guy. Doc Gooden was his uncle. So the thing that pisses me off most about Sheffield is the writers not doing their homework and linking him to the PED thing because of one small incident where he's working out with Bonds over a period of time, gets involved with the cream from Falco, immediately realizes, well not immediately, but over a short period of time realizes this isn't good for me. Gets away from it. His body never changed. His head never changed. He wasn't a PED guy. So you can't throw him in with all the obvious PED guys. And to do that is definitely a disservice. Now, having said that, I am voting for the PED guys now because 
I'm mad at the, the commissioner at the time. I'm mad. They they didn't they didn't they didn't they didn't uh, secure their game. So why do I got to be on the tower now? Or on the, you know a few good men standing in their garden when they let it all happen? So especially since that commissioner is in the Hall of Fame, the managers who had some of these guys were in the Hall of Fame. So I'm not keeping anybody out now. Basically, if they deserve it for what they're what they're so that, so that really got to me about Sheffield. And the other thing, and I'll let Will address this, but. Every pitcher I knew hated to face, face Sheffield. His sound, his bat was so fast, it made a different sound. I played baseball in college, so I understood it better than most writers. And I think we're getting to an era, and this is very important. People are going to think I'm a really an old man yelling at a cloud. We're getting to an era of writers who never played athletics, most of them. You know, uh, the Verducci, Verducci was a good athlete. Myself, uh, was a decent athlete. Bob Clappish pitched for many years, still pitches in like a men's league. So from that era of writers, we were just more involved in, in understanding how hard the job is. So, you know, I, I would watch Sheffield's bat and, and it would be amazing. And he swung a heavy bat, you know, guys, because he, uh, he, his hands were so fast, if he had a light bat, he would have. He may have been ahead of the ball, so so he did that for a reason. And also, once you got to know Sheffield, <laughs> Gary, he, he was a, he was a fun guy. I mean, I remember sitting with him talking one day, and don't forget he played early on in Milwaukee. So we're talking, and this is way off the course, but what the hell? Um, uh, <laughs> he goes, you know, we, we were talking about something, and somehow, somehow Jeffrey Dahmer's name came up, and and Sheffield oh, who. Sheffield is, is good, one of these guys who's segue. been everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Sheffield's been everywhere and has been involved in so many things. So he goes to me, he goes, you know, Kevin, I used to ride by Dahmer's house every day and there was a bad smell there coming from that house. <laughs> 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 so my point is, you could talk to Sheffield about anything if you wanted to talk to him about it, you know? And he, he was a great dude and uh, a good athlete, very proud man. And now he understands how much it means to his father. I'm sure he's pissed knowing Gary. He got screwed. But that's the way Gary looked at his whole – he always had a chip on his shoulder. And, uh, you know, once Freddie gets involved, once Leland gets involved, don't forget he carried Leland's team for the World Series in 97. Darren Dalton came in and kind of gave Gary the blueprint of – Hey, you got to lead this team. And Gary did exactly that. So Leland is in corner. McGriff's in his corner. I hope they get on the next kind of committee that deals with that aid, that, that, that era of player. And he should, he should get in unanimously, you know, from those voters. So I think Gary will be fine. It's, it's like everything else with Gary, it just went a little different and it's got to go by Gary's uh, tools, but nobody was a better hitter. Um, really clutch hitter, and he almost got that Yankee team, 2004. People forget about that, too. Yeah. You know, the, the one stat I'll throw at you, because I only use meaningful stats. Gary Sheffield, of 28 guys, I think, in the uh, 500 home run club, he's the number one right-handed batter with the fewest amount of strikeouts in 500 home runs. Number one. The only guys ahead of him in that in that group is Ted Williams, who, who was in the 700s, his strikeouts, and Mel Ott. 800s, I think. Gary's about uh, 1,100, roughly. Um, and, and both those guys were lefties. So he, he, had, he, he, he had 22 years. He had 500 home runs. He didn't strike out in an era of strikeouts to, a, to an unbelievable number. All you have to do is look at that number, and then you go check your box. It's that simple. For him not to get in, huge mistake by the writers. I 100% agree, and it's funny because I mean, the two guys ahead of him are not just Hall of Famers; they're like they're inner school top tier Hall yeah. of Famers. They're you know, right, so, right, so, right. yeah. So I mean, that's that's some pretty good company to keep for sure. Now, will that's not a hard number to look, up. look that up, fellas. No, it's up. not. It's not. So you know, and in the age of Google and everybody on their phones left and right, you'd think somebody could look that up and and make the correlation. But I agree that I think he got royally screwed. Um, well, now uh, you had uh, made a comment they facing Sheffield compared to uh, some of the other guys who did get in. So I'm going to let you take it from here and get your thoughts on him. And I always like to get thoughts on Andrew Jones because you did play with him in Atlanta, did you not? I didn't play with Andrew in, in Atlanta. You uh, did. I came in after he after he had left. Oh, um, okay. My mistake. But I thought you had. You know, since since we're banging the drum. And you're absolutely right, Kevin. That this should be a celebration. 
Mm-hmm. And those three guys that went in, they are well deserving. Um, I don't have to to Rocco's point, the first ballot, second ballot thing. That's not an issue with me until it becomes an issue. Mm-hmm. And here is my here is my biggest issue: is everybody will say that Yadier Molina is a first ballot Hall of Famer. And his numbers against Joe Maurer are Maurer's actual best case scenario for being in the hall. Wow. However, if you look at what Maurer did and then compare Yadier Molina and go, oh, okay, these guys are relatively the same player, you know, in, in the in the statistical categories, with Maurer being elevated in some, Yadier and others. And then you go, okay, Maurer's in on first ballot, but Sheffield falls off after 10. Get the... <laughs> exactly. Come on, get out of here with that noise. Exactly. You know, it, it, it just, it drives me bananas. Like, I get it. You're looking at 10-year composites. Well, how about the fact that Maurer played his last years? He, he couldn't catch anymore because his knees were gone. So he got all of his at-bats. I mean, the guy was a pro hitter. I faced him, and it, it was not a comfortable at-bat. I came out ahead, but lucky, but luckily, you know, I was never like, oh, I've got this guy. I mean, that was never the scenario. And that was in my prime where I was, I was really good against left-handed hitters. Well, he had a short swing. He had a short swing. You know, it it was compact. It was direct to the ball. It was all the things that you look for in anybody's swing. And he was, he was as much like Tony Gwynn Mm -hmm. as you could be. Because he wasn't there trying to accumulate home runs or doubles. Those were byproducts of great swings and great approaches. And that's what hitters are, in my opinion. If you look at great hitters throughout time, yeah, there are guys who are power guys. There are guys who are contact guys. But great hitters are so few and far between that can hit for average, that can hit for power, that can hit in clutch situations. And then, I mean, if you say that RBIs don't matter, or if you say that batting average doesn't matter, if you look at any of these things and you pull them out and take a microscopic view, well, yeah, sure. That's like me going in and saying, well, I've got this track man data, and based on spin rate, spin rate alone, these guys are the ultimate. And then then you, you end up working yourself into a mathematical corner and you paint yourself into a corner very akin to the rule book where you go oh war actually matters yes and you're like oh, that's a great i mean that's a it's a great little formula it's a good litmus test for whether somebody was good or not but it's not the ultimate and to treat it as such is just an abomination to what people actually did on the field i mean i was looking at this um Let's see here. Andrew Jones has a higher war than Gary Sheffield. Yeah. <laughs> here's another here's another fun one. Um, let's see here. Oh, okay. Tony Gwynn has a 69.2 war. Gary Sheffield has a 60.5. Wow. But if you look at statistically what Sheffield was able to do, I mean, like, you can't compare apples and oranges. Like Tony Gwynn was a great hitter. Gary Sheffield was a great power hitter. And, and, and honestly, the two guys that got screwed the most beyond beyond Sheffield in this whole thing are Billy Wagner yep. and Andy freaking Pettit. I vote for Pettit every year, and I get in arguments with people about this. Winning matters. Winning in the big time matters. And Pettit... Pettit, uh, you you watch I, I, you watch uh, next year. Well, we're, we're gonna head you people forward ahead a little bit here, so you can start getting pissed off. Next year, CC will probably slide in, right? Um, I'm nothing against CC. I covered him most of his career. Um, I think he I think he's right in the same number of wins, if not fewer, than Andy. You know, so it, it's like it's it's there's this whole devaluating of. Of of batting average and wins drives me absolutely insane. So it has so. to be a mosaic theory where you look at all the pieces together and what they form 
as like opposed that. to taking one tile out and saying that's the composite. It's like the three guys who describe the elephant. One's on the trunk, one's on the tail, one's on the side. You know, it's like a snake, it's like a wall, it's like a pig. You know, which one is it? It's a freaking elephant. Do your homework, show your work. I love that. Show your work. That's a great, uh, I'm going to steal that down the road or, or court you about mosaic, because it is a mosaic. It's art. It's art. Baseball is art, you know? So let's look at the whole big picture. And what's it, crazy, and speaking, what's speaking crazy of elephants, too, I'd hate to be the guy that behind the elephant, looking up that, 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 that view. <laughs> Absolutely. I can, get a good, I can get a good look at a steak by sticking my head up a bull's ass, but I'd rather take the butcher's <laughs> word for it. <laughs> Exactly. What what dri oh, what drives Lord. me bananas is is, is that and, and and this is this is truly the great divide. You know, I, I could have the same I could have the same con uh, conversation with Brian Kenny over the mathematics of things, or Petriello, or you know whoever, and we can all agree because we're we're just we're human beings and we can come and regress to the mean and figure out something where we can get along. My problem is this, and this is the state of the game, is that it baseball in and of itself is a math equation. Playing the game of baseball, it is strictly mathematical. Judging the game and how you play the game is art. Mm. And those are contrasting and contradictory positions. And finding a way to blend them together is the most difficult thing that a player, a front office, a writer, whomever it is, has to do. Because you're trying to explain one thing in terminologies that are not capable of explaining them. You can't explain art through math or math through art. And it's always been that way. There's always been math in baseball. When I was dealing with Jack McKean way back, way back when, uh, Jack was a wizard at the, uh, you know, at Wall Street, you know, playing, playing the stocks. Uh, matter of fact, one year when he was with Kansas City managing, they were only going to give him a very small raise, and he wouldn't be making as much as the second baseman. I forget who the second baseman was, but he wasn't very good. And Jack got pissed off, and he said, you, you're not going to pay me as much as this guy? Are you kidding me? So you know what he did to the uh, owner? He said, why don't you give me some of that stock in your pharmaceutical company? And, and the <laughs> owner did. Jack, that, that stock split so many times, each of Jack's kids got sent to college on that stock. Okay, yeah. so you can't tell me that math wasn't used by managers back then. They always use math. They just come up with new terminologies about it. And baseball is, that's a great description. It's art and it's math. <laughs> I love it when Rocco chuckles. It makes me so happy. He sits <laughs> over there. He sits over there silent like a turtle, and they just <laughs> and then goes back. He's almost like uh, he's like the uh, you know one of the uh, cartoon shows like the uh, on TV with the uh, um, you know the adult cartoon shows. You know they're pretty funny. That's Rocco. He's a character. Well, I was going to go with uh, Beavis and Butthead there. That's yeah, cool. a little Beavis and Butthead too. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, there, that's where you want to go with well, Beavis. <laughs> We haven't really gotten into Billy Wagner, so I know you actually, a while back, you had brought up some uh, reasons why you had shifted position on, on Billy Wagner. So I was figuring, let's uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you look at, at the guys in the hall, um, the Trevor Hoffmans, the Bruce Suters, uh, you know, Raleigh Fingers, those kind of guys, Lee Smith, uh, Wagner's every bit as good as any of them. Um, yeah, I was one of the guys who kind of would look at it and he was a little light on innings pitched for a reliever. Uh, I thought he was significantly behind Eckersley. Um, but then in the years kind of looking more at his case and I always loved Wagner as a Mets fan. He was, he was great. Um, you know, some struggles in the postseason, but uh, you know, one of my favorite guys, uh, he's somebody I really came around on and it's, it was a lot of talking to, to big leaguers too. Um, and just getting their opinions on these guys. Um, he's somebody that, that people wanted out there closing games. Um, he's one of the hardest pitchers to ever hit in baseball history. Um, and that's not even, um, you know, hyperbole. You could look at the statistics. Um, and another thing, our buddy, Phil Cuzzy, I still remember a conversation I had with him years ago. 
and we were playing bocce and I asked, I said, who's the hardest pitcher for you to pick up, uh, for you to call a game for? And he went, he said, Billy Wagner can't pick his ball up out of his hand. Tough to see the movement ball just explodes out of him. Um, I, yeah, exactly right. And he had that, you know, almost like a shot put kind of, kind of thing. So, um, I, I really come around on him. Somebody I always admired being a small hall guy, you know, kind of drew the line with him, but, but I think he's a hundred percent deserving and, and he'll be in next year. Um, you know, I think pretty easily with, with each row and CC. All right. So Kevin, you had a good point about Billy Wagner as well that you wanted to bring up. So floor is yours. Yeah. I, I, first of all, I'm shocked he didn't get in this year. I mean, uh, you know, how, how could he not, not get those votes, uh, especially in this age we live in now where everything is, is so looked at. But one point I want to make about Billy, he was great. He, and all actually all these guys were good at it, the guys that made it. These guys were very good at, to talk to. Billy was always fun to talk to. Billy, give you, he gives you stuff, man. He, he, he uh, wasn't afraid and stood at his locker. I had to laugh, you know, after the Bills loss, you know, Diggs wasn't nowhere to be found. Ed Oliver was nowhere to be found. You know, these baseball guys, and, and, and Will can attest to this, you know, they, they got to stand at their locker, you know, good or bad. And, you know, that's one of the things I liked about Edwin, Edwin Diaz doing his struggles with the Mets back when I was covering on a daily basis. I remember a game he blew in L.A. That was just one of the ugliest of all time. And he stood there for 25 minutes and answered questions, you know. So, so Billy was always accountable. He was funny, knowledgeable. Um, uh, and, and getting in a conversation, you got to remember, Rick Peterson was the pitching coach, too. So, so you had the, the Rick Peterson angle and the Billy angle. I had a lot of quotes coming out of there. It was almost as good as back in the day when I had Eric Shaw and then uh, Pat Dobson. Pat Dobson was one of the all-time greatest pitching coaches. So... Uh, one day, and I don't mean to go on a tangent here, but this is what makes it fun. Uh, one day, Shao shit all over himself on the mound, basically, blew the game. And Eric is super smart guy, super smart guy, but smartest guy in the house, you know, but nice guy. So we went over to Dauber and we said, uh, uh, you know, what happened there? Uh, he's got a little problem with his sphincter muscle. And um, uh, he goes, I don't know if you guys know this. And now this is on the record, on the record after a game. Dobby, Bobber looks at his elbow. He goes, it's a little known fact that the, uh, the uh, sphincter muscle is directly attached to a uh, ligament that runs through the elbow. And, <laughs> and basically his sphincter tightened up, you know. So, so, so I appreciate good quotes. And the other thing about Billy, I'll leave it at this. Billy retired at a time so he could spend more time with his family. So I'm never going to hold that against him. He could have compiled more, you know, and then people complain, oh, he's a compiler. So you can't win half the time. The bottom line, much like Sheffield, hitters didn't want to face Billy. Pitchers didn't want to face Sheffield. If you keep things simple sometimes, you make better decisions when you're doing your whole fame ballot. Great. True statement. Will, I know you had something to – you wanted to add something about Sheffield too, so – no, no, I'm, 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 I've, I've lost my train of thought because Kevin made such a great point on the simplification of things. Uh, it, it, it just, it boggles my mind that at no point do the players have a vote in this. Ah, uh, good point. Yeah, it, you know, e even if it was just a selected committee, because it would at least give scope. You know, you, you go, hey, we can take this stuff in a vacuum. But, you know, Sheffield in the 509 home runs, 500 was automatic. Mm -hmm. And th this word compiler has such a negative connotation. It came out of nowhere. And I, I, I don't know which, I don't want to call names, but I don't know what asshat made that up. <laughs> but I want to I squarely punch him because you know what? Everybody who's in the hall freaking compiled stats. That's you what know it's all about. Because they played for a long freaking time. You know why? Because they were really freaking good. <laughs> well, you know, well, that's something that gets me. I mean, I mean that, how, there's how, Omar how does Vizquel. Get punished there's for Omar having a long career. You know, I mean, yeah, how is that? There's how is Omar that a Vizquel. Right you had there. longevity. You were able to play three, two or three decades, and and you're going to get punished for that. And yeah, you make that their problem. That's good. You make you know? adjustments. Omar Vizquel. Got, yeah. Omar Vizquel. Yeah. Had almost three thousand hits, had 
four almost or almost three times as many home runs as Ozzy Smith. He had a better batting average. He had roughly the exact same on base percentage. He got two less gold gloves. Get the out of here if you think that Omar Vizquel <laughs> isn't one of the greatest shortstops of all time. I'm sorry he didn't hit 300 home runs. Find me the litmus test for greatness. It's the players who played against him and just go, dude, that guy is getting it done. Well, that's great points on that. And one thing I will say, I, I didn't think about that you said it, because I've always been the writer's it's the writers' awards. It's always been that way. They, like I said, the writers take it very seriously. I think there were generations of writers who actually allowed the players to get in on the voting because they would ask. I always talk to the players. Is this guy is so and so a Hall of Famer? Is he this? Is he that? So I would take players' input. I think there's a generation of writers now who don't take the players' input because all they're looking at is the assistant GM nerd who is giving them numbers and not looking, not talking to players directly about it. So in my mind, players always had input on the Hall of Fame because we talked to the players. The good, the good writers, then I mentioned a couple of them before, we would have long conversations about players, plus we'd see it. And then the player would, you know, like Piazza. Somebody brought up Piazza earlier. That was a no-brainer. I voted for Piazza early on, right from the start. Are you kidding? Goose Gossett, way back when. I pushed for Goose Gossett before anybody else, and he eventually got in. Um, so, so if you talk to the players, if you do your homework, like Bill Belichick says, do your job. Part of your job as a writer is to make sure you talk to the players, especially the guys who've been around and know their stuff and are well-spoken, and you get their opinion, and you, you put that in your whole mosaic as Will said, of uh, what you're voting for, and then the players will have input. So if the writers do their job, the players will have input. If they don't do their job, the players will not have input. 100%. Let me hijack this before Chris gets in here and tries to move us on. This is an actual conversation I had with an actual human being. Okay? It's 2008. I'm playing for the Atlanta Braves, and this person will remain unnamed by choice. Yep. And we had a third baseman who was okay at the game of baseball. Switch hit, played for a while. And his name came up in conversation. And I go, okay, yeah, so that's a first ballot hall guy. And this person who covered our team, was in the clubhouse every day, looked at me and said, really? You think? <laughs> and I looked at him and I was like, Wait, I'm I'm sorry. I need to full body reset. This is the greatest switch hitter since Mickey Mantle. What's your problem? And he, and he goes, "Well, I'm not sure." I go, "Show your work. Come wow. back to me tomorrow. I wow. dare you to come back to me tomorrow with a cohesive and cogent answer on this." And he comes back the next day and he goes, "I'm really sorry." I go, you, you freaking should be. This is your job. How do I know more? Unbelievable. I'm like, I'm watching this guy every day doing shit that nobody on the planet can do. Yeah. Okay. And I found and I found my Sheffield thing. Oh, good. Oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so of all the current outfielders, poster boys of the of the current era, who is who is the guy? That everybody looks at right now and says he's in. Are uh, you Trout? Yeah. Okay. Look at these numbers compared to Mr. Gary Sheffield. <laughs> Mike has an 85 war. Gary has a 60.5. Okay. Gary played in a thousand more games, has 5,000 more plate appearances. Wow. Okay. Has a thousand more hits has 150 more home runs, has 700 more RBIs, has 50 more stolen bases, and is only nine points lower in batting average. Okay, The only things that Trout has on him are batting average, on base, slugging, and OPS. Two more All-Stars. Four more Silver Sluggers. Wow. 
And those are the numbers that we're not supposed to pay attention to. Your batting average, your OBP, your slugging, your OPS. And, well, let me add, he, the, the, the best ability to have is availability. Gary was yeah. there. Trout is hurt often. Right. And you, you just look at it and you go, okay, so this number has some fallacy to it, obviously. But here, my argument would be, yeah. Mike Trout is easily the best that is sitting out there in today's game. So per the generation he's playing in, yeah, he is the poster child for going in. But Gary Sheffield at that time was also a poster child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's going to bring us to our final thought segment. Um, since we know that Sheffield obviously got, got boned, I, I would like to go around and ask for your, I'll, we'll take four all time historical hall of fame screw jobs. And, uh, I'll just be very quick with mine. Mine are Thurman, Louis Tiant, Dick Allen, and obviously Barry Bonds. I think all those guys got hosed. I think they should all get in at some point or another. Um, and I'd like to go around and we'll start, we'll start with Kevin quick. Give me your top four screw jobs. Well, I think you should start with Will because I think he wants to lead the way on this because he's got the <laughs> – I don't want to steal his thunder. I got a All little right. amped up. I jumped the gun. Maybe you'll hit the edit button. I don't know. But Go ahead, Will. Joe Jackson. Will, you yeah, – yeah, Go ahead. Wait, what happened? Keep Shoeless that blood Joe. pressure up, baby. Okay. Shoeless Joe Jackson, Absolutely could be in the Hall of Fame. It is the longest screw job in the history of the game. Kennesaw Mountain Landis did a great thing for the, for the integrity of baseball. The rules are in place, and it precludes Pete Rose from ever getting in because he violated the rule on gambling. There is no proof ever that Shoeless Joe did anything to affect that World Series negatively. Simply put, he deserves to be in. That's the longest screw job ever. Then I'm going to put the onus strictly on the writers now. Kevin, I'm sorry you're being you're right. lumped into this group, but the fact that the start the fact that the writers collectively started referring to the steroid era as the steroid era, they named it means that Barry Bonds, Alex Rodriguez, Manny Ramirez, and anybody else implicated in the Mitchell report, regardless of whether they were penalized and served suspension, means that they should be in simply because the era follows the name of the thing they were implicated in taking. All right. Can dig it. Let's go over to Kevin. Well, I, I'm going to duplicate a little bit because I think, you know, uh, Munson we mentioned. And I want to make one more point on Munson. And I'll bring it in. Um, he died in a plane crash. It's not like he quit after 10 years, you know. <laughs> he died in a plane crash. How come that's not taking into consideration for the big picture? Like, well, if he had played five more years, which he would have, DHing and done some things, maybe family-wise he would have wanted to get out. But uh, if he added a few more years, those numbers go up higher. So we're back to him. Shoeless Joe, I, I got to put him in my top four, too, simply because. Of course. And, and to back up Will's point, this is what I always say, he got a lifetime suspension. Well, he's been dead for 71 years. So he's had a double lifetime suspension, basically. And I'm 71 this year, so hopefully I don't mean that uh, that's the end for me, too. But but uh, You don't look a day over 72. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Shoeless Joe, I mean, and, and if you do the home, I, I, I actually became, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of research with the guy who ran the Shoeless Joe Museum in Greenville. I don't think he's there anymore, but he was a Chicago guy who just sunk into it. And he has so much information on the fact, you know, and, and we've heard it all. He hit the home, only home run. He did this. He did that. So, Shoeless Joe should be in. And baseball just keeps making money off of Shoeless Joe with the, the game in Iowa, you know, this and that. It's all Shoeless Joe. But you can't let him in the Hall of Fame. So, my point is, even if he did something that was bad, put it on the plaque. I wrote about it today, the plaque. It's being so important uh but you can pull all this stuff on the plaque why can't you just put a guy in and like bonds bonds has got to be there uh 
why can't you put on the plaque, you know, about the steroid stuff and Balco? You just put a couple sentences on there and it's done. So it's the history of the game. I'm going to throw another name out there. I think Clemens, you know, uh, the strikeouts, where he's at, what he meant to the game. Um, and, 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 and these guys, this sounds crazy, but all these guys did a lot of this stuff, obviously, to get better. But they love the game so much. And he, even Ted Williams, I remember Ted Williams saying, you know, I might have done some of this stuff if it was around in my time, you know. Uh, I, I won't mention I won't I won't mention the player because I don't think he'd he'd like this right now, but a, a superstar, I'll say this. A superstar who's in the Hall of Fame. So I show up one day in spring training and this superstar who's in the Hall of Fame starts giving me shit over um, me voting for a rod I, I not a at the time I'm sorry me voting for bonds uh, bonds and Clemens and um, I said to him I said yeah but you know and we're going back and forth and again much like the bond situation that I told you about earlier finally I said to him and I use this I use his name I said so and so I said yeah you know what there's some people who think you were the first steroid guy you know I said it right to his face and um, he steps back, and someday, maybe if I write a, a book, I'll put his name in, but, but or later on, but he steps back, and he, he doesn't deny it. He says, that's because I was so damn good, you know? So these guys were so damn good, they should be in the Hall of Fame. It's that simple. All right. That's my story. I, could, I have to, I mean, Rocco, I know you have a... Uh, oh, well, I'm you? sorry, I got one other thing. Oh, boy. No, go ahead. I want to mention Ichiro because we haven't talked about him yet. He, you know, that's I'm looking ahead. He's going to be. He, I'm I'm predicting now he'll be unanimous next year. And I got along great with Ichiro. It's a fair prediction. Yeah, and and Ichiro loves the Hall of Fame on his own. Ichiro used to drive up to the Hall of Fame. He's been there about five or six times. So he's my man. That's awesome. Ichiro used to love. Uh, uh, this is this is a funny story too. So Ichiro comes to the Yankees. We hit it off. He speaks great English, and he curses. He's funny as hell. And um, because I was close to Jeter, he saw that, so he kind of took me in. And because I'm so, I ask good questions about the game. You know the way he, I never seen a player protect his equipment like Ichiro did, or, or take care of it. He had a box of like this metal humidor for his gloves. You know, so we used to talk about all that kind of stuff. And these are the fun things you talk to players about. It doesn't have to be about the game. So we really hit it off. He goes to the Marlins, and you guys got a picture of this. This is funny. Um, so he goes to the Marlins. I go there the first day that he's going to be in Marlin camp. I said, oh, let me go down and do an Ichiro story. At the time, I had the freedom to call my own shots and that stuff. So we're waiting outside the Jupiter uh, clubhouse um, on the sidewalk because we're not allowed in, in the clubhouse yet. It's only in the morning. It's me, a couple other writers I knew, and a contingent of Japanese writers, you know, because they travel with each row like you wouldn't believe. Um, and, and it's, 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 uh, so it's going to be interesting next year with the Dodgers. They're going to set a record for media, by the way, just because of what they got going on with the Japanese players. So, so each and our, and I, like, we got along, but we didn't make a big deal of it. So nobody really knew it, you know. So Ichiro comes out, and I, I knew the guy who ran the parking lot, so he gave me a high sign when Ichiro pulled in. So I'm ready for it. I put myself in position. And Ichiro comes walking down the sidewalk, you know, all these Japanese media are covering him. And he, 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 all, he makes a beeline right to me and gives me a big hug. And all the Japanese writers are looking at like, Kevin, we didn't know. Because <laughs> they respected Ichiro so much. And, and they said, well, you know, wow. So... So I love Ichiro. He's going to get my vote, and I'm looking forward to next year because he, he's a guy who has been to the Hall of Fame and deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. And that's it for me tonight. All right. Well, Rocco, let's get your four, and then uh, it's time for you to do your odd budsmaning. My list is uh, Billy Martin, George Steinbrenner, Kurt Flood, Dale Murphy, with oh, Keith Hernandez yes. also in there being screwed. And Hernandez oh. didn't even make the full 15 years. He was off after nine years. Um, that's incredible, man. right? That's incredible, Rocco. Good list, yeah. Great list, Rocco. Can I add one to it? Yes, Rafael right. Palmero. Oh, Palmero, there you go. Yeah, I man. was looking at his numbers yesterday. Yep, they're stupid. They are stupid. He didn't strike out much <laughs> either, right? 3, yeah. He didn't strike out much. 
No. He was kind of good at baseball. A little bit, slightly. Hurt, so, hurt uh, blood, and Dale Murphy. Love you for bringing those up. And Murphy was another guy. If you look at him, he he was on for 15 years, but he would get like 10% of the vote. There was one year in the middle where he was like 10 votes away from falling off the ballot. I mean, he never really even had any momentum with the writers. It, it's pretty crazy when you look at it that way. And what's what's really bananas, like Kevin Kevin's mentioned this a couple of times or at least alluded to it. You know, like he loves Ichiro, and Ichiro was such a great guy, and he was accessible even though he was a superstar. And I think this speaks more to a societal perspective, but this was never the Hall of Nice. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of mean cusses that are in the Hall of Fame. But as society has kind of changed its tune and softened a little bit, and we have to be all sorts of respectful, a guy like Gary Sheffield, who was on his own program, and maybe played with a chip on his shoulder and acted like it too, and maybe was a little gruff with the media, all of a sudden that affects his his numbers. But yet a guy who's very nice and accessible and respectful, that inflates his numbers? I mean, we're talking about... And this is why, this is why I would argue that the players need to be involved a little bit because it, it kind of shades it differently. Big oh, time. Perfect. And like, and Dale Murphy, Dale Murphy was a good dude. Like, how did he never get traction? Did he not get in enough fights? <laughs> Too nice. Well, no, the writers, uh, you know, the Dale Murphy thing, I could never figure out either. And, uh, and, and also he did everything you were supposed to do in the game, you know, good teammate. I think Joe Torrey had the great quote about, about, you know, he was a great teammate. He'd be a great son-in-law, great father, great brother, whatever. That's Dale Murphy. So, so this, you know, I think I think the hall likes some of this because it keeps it going. You know, mm -hmm. it keeps them in the conversation with some of the screw-ups and things like that. And um, and 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 getting back to Ichiro, one other stat I forgot to mention: he comes to he comes to the major leagues at twenty-seven and still gets three thousand hits. Pretty nice. That's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, and, and just really quick, you know, one little thing on each rose. I went down to when he was on the Marlins. Um, I went down, you know, we got, you know, for like for 50 bucks, you can get into the Diamond Club, have a nice meal and whatever. I think for 150, you can get in that bat in Miami. But so, you know, so we're leaving, <laughs> we're on the way out to the seats. And, um, you know, in their batting cage, the Marlins batting cage is right there, like on the way out. You know to the seats from the diamond club and you can see in i'm you know and i guess there's like a way glass thing there so i i look in and each row's in there before the game just taking hacks and i just i was like wow this is crazy and i'm the only stand there and i'm standing at the end of the cage so he's facing me just swinging and just hitting line drives right at me i missed a half of an inning just standing and watching him for 15 minutes uh, it's, it's great that it's just you know the game's going on He's just in there taking hacks, and it, it was, it was like a top tier baseball moment. I just sat there like with my mouth agape, just sitting there like, "Holy shit, this is like a private show," of you know, just getting to watch each, just hit them wherever the hell he wanted, and that's that's my little. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know what happens at the end of these episodes. Rocco Constantino comes to the rescue, telling us what we screwed up. Our ombudsman, ladies and gentlemen, Rocco Constantino. Nice, thanks. Just a few things here. Um, first off, Sheffield will come up in front of the Veterans Committee in December 2025, so he may not have to wait long. Uh, he would be class of 2026 if they put him in with that, uh, possibly with Andrew Jones and Carlos Beltran. Um, I think that might be the 26th class. Uh, great comparison between Andy Pettit and CC Sabathia. Pettit, um, 256 and 153. Uh, 3.85 um, 3.85 ERA uh, CC very similar uh, 251 and 161 3.74 ERA um, I mean just about mirror images of each other there uh, let's see what else we got here uh, Will Oman mentioned he did well against Joe Maurer uh, faced him eight times only gave up one hit so one for yeah. eight uh, there nice job uh, and then we're going to end it with some uh, stat only um, 
There's only four pitchers that face Todd Helton as many as uh, eight at bats without giving up a hit. You got Rob Nen, Jeff Samarja, Randy Flores, and Will Oman. Oh, oh. excellent! Look at you. That's what we got. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> Let well, me ask you, you that one thank little you. thing with uh, facing him. Uh, you know, guess who the one? And you can look to the next show, but. Tony Gwynn used to always tell me, and Tony, we all know about the Maddox numbers and everything, and that's that stuff. Tony always told me the one guy he couldn't hit, Omar Dahl. So well, Rock, that'll be your homework assignment yeah. next time we meet. We next can talk time. about his numbers against Omar Dahl. <laughs> and Omar didn't get a lot it. of guys out, but but he got Tony out. <laughs> but he just had his I'm telling you, there, there's some inexplicable reasons. <laughs> I mean, te technically, well, I could tell you why, but that would actually sound like I'm tooting my own horn. But then I could, con uh, conversely, I could tell you why I kept a bunch of 240 hitters in the league for a long time. Well, I was, I was going to ask you, and we'll <laughs> save it for the next show, but I, I was really curious how you would attack Mauer. That would be interesting to hear. And uh, I, I think our young listeners would like to hear that, too. Because you got to think when you're out there, you can't be a robot. I, I, I would say I, I would say this if if you Maurer was uh, for me at the time that I faced him was a simpler game plan than Todd Helton. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I for some reason just my arsenal matched up against Maurer, and and it worked. I had to work a lot harder against Todd Helton. And I got I got lucky results. I mean, some of those balls were hit fairly firm. <laughs> Just happened to be a guy with a glove in the way. Yeah, that's hey, that's that baseball. Helps. Yeah, that helps. Well, listen, uh, we definitely have enough ammo for an, another episode, so I'm looking forward to that already. But uh, for now, I want to say thank you, Will, Rocco, Kevin. Always a pleasure. I'm glad we're back doing these, uh, getting tuned up for the regular season. I'm Chris Vitale. This has been Roundhouse. Gentlemen, thank you again, and uh, we will catch you next time. <laughs>